episode 241 of the TV Dudes Podcast, recorded June 12th, 2019, mid-season check-in. debate about whether or not this was a mid-season or a mid-year. I think it's mid-year. It's it is mid-year, but June. that's not a TV thing. But it's mid-season is the winter time, isn't it? No, it's our that season. Uh, that doesn't make any this sense. This is the mid-season of our, of our discontent. We don't do seasons in our show. We we never end. No, we're just, Like this Good is Morning a, America. I thought we were doing one long season. Is that not what we're doing? One long season? Well, okay, shit. Let, let's count Dude, this out. We're, if we're, we started in 2010, <laughs> and this is finally our uh-huh. mid-season... We have another fucking nine years of this. Yeah, we have nine more years, and then we have to stop doing it. Oh, man. But we have to do it nine more years. <laughs> uh, folks, we are the TV Dudes. I'm Grant. I'm Randy. I'm Kyle. I'm Les. And, yeah, we're talking about uh, our favorite shows so far this year. 2019 is the year. Yep. This is a mid-year slash mid-season it's, check-in. It's I'm glad we're doing this. The end of your list is always so crazy. There's always a moment where I go, shit, what was the greatest thing I'd ever seen in my whole life back in March? Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah, yeah we, did, we were talking at the fest, and I suggested what that— What fest? Oh, the ATX TV Fest, which okay. you can hear on last week's episode, and ongoing in Les's secondary fest presented through interviews. Uh, welcome any new listeners that we right. have. Right, and I was going to say, we thought possibly after doing a big karaoke thing that we might have some new listeners, and we're hoping that we have some new I listeners hope we out have there. Some. And what, we hope wait. we haven't lost you with this rambling introduction. What, what karaoke thing are you talking about? I'm going to kill you. <laughs> <laughs> I believe so. Grant is referring to the ATX Television Fest TV theme karaoke hosted by Permanent Record and the TV Dudes. Yes. I, that's is us. That, is that the one, Grant? That would be it. So if you are a new listener, first of all, know that our introductions always go this way. Uh, well, always. What's, they're what's gone. The, how's, what's the third way, Randy? And now our listeners yeah, are gone. Third and way. and uh, second, welcome. We hope you enjoy this rundown of... Uh, a look at sort of what our taste is as a podcast, what we think the best stuff on TV is, and hopefully you'll be like, oh, I like what these guys like. I'm going to see what else they like and listen to their podcast every week. This reminds me of like when shows come back after midseason and they're like – the like, first three minutes is just like a wrap-up of everything that's ever happened on the show. Previously, Previously on, on TV, TV Dudes. Dudes. Yeah. That's what we're doing right now. Welcome. Everything is chaotic. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, this is a callback to last week, but we didn't talk about – Letter Kenny last week opened with their previously on. And <laughs> they're previously on because Letter Kenny is just goof- is was a series of characters <laughs> farting. Oh my god, it goes on for like two minutes. It was <laughs> so beautiful. long. So by that you mean oh, Letter Kenny book. is this TV show from Canada that did a panel at ATX Television Fest, yes. which is what we covered in last week's episode of our podcast. Thank you, Captain Context. Okay, <laughs> <sighs> sweating. <laughs> And they keep us focused here. Uh, keep kinda, us in line. I kind of like Context Commander. <laughs> More of a Context role. Commander. Yeah. Context Commander. So, folks, uh, yes, we are the TV Dudes. We are going to be talking about some of these shows that uh, we've been enjoying for the first part of 2019. Before we get into all of that, I did want to say, if you guys uh, want to help support us, if you have been listening to this show for a while, you you like the cut of our jib. And you want to toss us a couple uh, doubloons? I was like, we're no shekels, but okay. Uh, jib is like a boat thing, right? Sure. I'm trying to be nautical. A little is bit nautical, our new theme? Naughty, at least. <laughs> a little naughty. Uh, nautical uh, by nature. Patreon.com slash TV dudes. Go there and make a per episode donation. That means that if we post an episode, you pay money to us as much as you said you will pay money. And if you don't... If we don't post something, you don't have to pay anything. I swear, I thought that was going in a mafia direction. If you don't pay the money, <laughs> we're going to send somebody to break your legs. We want our dollar. You hear this <laughs> knuckle cracking here? <laughs> that was mm. really nicely done. <laughs> Thanks. I'm a Foley artist. <laughs> uh, anyway, yeah, so uh, thank you guys all for your patronage. We also occasionally try to put up some exclusive bonus content on our uh, TV Dudes Patreon page. And we're aware we've been falling behind on that. We have a new plan to catch up. Yeah, we've been we've just been a little uh, uh, busy throwing a karaoke party. Yeah, we ran a karaoke. What karaoke party was that, Grant? That was at the ATX Television Fest's season eight karaoke. So long ago, party. <laughs> 
Are we still promoting it? It's in the past. <laughs> like <laughs> Time is real. People no. can't go anymore. Karaoke parties are a flat circle, Carl. We are still promoting it because Les did 39 interviews that we have to post. <laughs> so, <laughs> so just to give people a baseline of what this episode is going to be, we're not going in order. We're not doing like a top five countdown or anything. Mm-hmm. We picked six shows out of a list, and we all picked some of our favorites. We're going to talk about those shows in depth. And then I'm going to run down a list of, hey, here's the other stuff that we really liked but didn't quite make the cut. Well, it's interesting because if, if we think about this year so far, there's been a bunch of big shows that have come to finales. Like yeah. Game of Thrones, of course, is is that big obvious one. Veep, mm. Crashing, You're the Worst. Yeah. Crashing? Mm-hmm. That was the Crazy end of X. Crashing? Yep. No, it was not. Crazy Ex-Girlfriend? Yes, it was. That was not the – that That was the finale. Wow. Yeah. I did not know that. I know. I was sad when that I That doesn't make it. sense. What yeah. happened to him in the end? Uh, Pete became a stand-up comedian. Everything went great. Spoilers. Oh. Yeah, that's, that's how oh. it goes for comedians. Yeah. Good, good for him. <laughs> Artie's life is amazing. <laughs> Everything, yeah. Everything worked out great. Everything's coming up. Artie. New York still smells like urine. <laughs> okay, <laughs> fair enough. Oh, that's so weird to me. That's so weird that it was the final I, season. I think it might have been a budgety thing, if it, and as much, more, not much so much a, hey, let's end it here. <laughs> Wait, HBO, right? Yeah, it's HBO. Sopranos ending. <laughs> yeah, just cut it short. Just cut it short. Uh, okay, yeah. So, yeah, there were some big events, but I, I don't think we're going to necessarily uh, hit on those. We're going to talk about some of these uh, smaller ones or ones that just, like, really caught us by surprise. Yep. And what's the first one? First one, Grant, you were going to lead us off on Barry. Barry, because I think we're doing alphabetical. So. Yes, alphabetical. Barry, that's a letter B. It starts at the beginning of the alphabet. Everyone knows this. The beginning of the alphabet starts with an A. Oh, fuck. I don't know our alphabet. <laughs> uh, Barry is an amazing little show. It's so it's so tight, and it, it presented itself initially as a comedy, and it is not. It is not. <laughs> it is sometimes hilariously funny, but it's not a a straight up comedy. It's a dark comedy with some really dark dramatic moments. I love how the show starts with kind of the simple idea, you know, uh, hitman meets actor. But every episode, it builds on it, and it just is constantly turning into, like, this new thing. And, yeah, it has gone far from, like, the comedy route. Season two was stronger than season one, which I know everybody really, really loved. Yeah, I I think season one, some people might not have known, like, what to make of the show initially. Mm -hmm. But by by season two, the show knows what it is, Mm -hmm. clearly. And everyone who's watching is on board because they they are, they now recognize what the show is trying to do in season one. Yep. And yeah, I think that what I'm I'm just so taken with is like all of the performances are fucking top notch, mm-hmm. and like at times like peculiarly like understated. Like he has like this whole like improv class of like A list actors that are. Uh, or b- at least B-list actors mm-hmm. that are in his little entourage that just do like a line here or there in an episode. And I'm like, how do you have Darcy Carden as a, a background cl- player? Uh, Kirby. Uh, yeah, Kirby, Kirby Baptiste. Baptiste. Kirby Hal Baptiste. Just like as a, a background player in your uh, th- improv group. That is my only complaint about the show, which I think got really good this season, is that how do you waste those two actresses on on nothing? Best episode of any TV series Probably that I've yeah. seen this year happened in episode, I want to say, four. Yeah. Um, have we even gotten to talk since this episode? We have, we have not th- talked about it. The second I watched it, I was like, I want to get on the mic right now. Yeah, that was uh, agreed. It is. Um, I, we must have talked about it. You haven't even episode, mentioned it. We just we all have, know what you're talking about. We have not. It is episode five, Ronnie Lilly. And it is a weird Coen Brothers esque, like Raising Arizona style, where Barry and uh, Fuchs go out of town and on. It goes so fucking off the rails from what the tradition of this show has yes. been. Yeah. That I, my jaw was dropped. Yeah. And then I was like, I can't stop laughing and being just blown away by what they're doing in this half hour comedy. It's, the, comedy. Season, <laughs> the season was great, but that episode elevated everything. And it was really, it is the. It's definitely in the running for best single episode of television of 2019. It's a Pulp Fiction-esque, weird-ass thing. (laughs) Yeah. Um, When she bites him on the cheek, uh, (laughs) fukes on the cheek, and then just refuses to let go. This little girl bites him on the cheek. And he's like, oh, my God, what do I do? Because he also had super glued his hands to the steering wheel. Like, the the comedy that they've built up Mm -hmm. into that scene is just one of the most brilliant things I've seen on television. Yeah. And I was howling. And then she scurries up that tree. Mm-hmm. <laughs> All of it. It was just this weird waking nightmare. And I'm like, this, ah. You know what else I loved? They knew what they had. 
Like you could tell they did the after interview, and they the reason they did that inter- that show is because their stunt coordinator had pitched them like, look, we got this like ten year old girl or thirteen year old girl or whatever she is <laughs> who can do all these stunts. Like, what do you want to do? And they built a show around her. And they knew. Like and they the, knew they had this amazing episode. And her dad. And her dad. He's yeah. also a professional stuntman. Mm-hmm. And he By was way, great. And it's a payoff to a storyline that's been running since episode one where the ex-partner of, uh, of the, the, woman, the cop that Barry killed in season one has tumbled to what's going on. And there's a great reveal in I think it's episode, oh, yeah. it episode four. Yeah, it's episode four where he catches up to him and he's got Fuchs wearing a wire. And you think this is like the, oh, he's got Barry. He's going to take him in. And he's like, I want you to kill my ex-wife's lover. And he's like, what? <laughs> That's the name of the episode. Yeah. What? <laughs> yeah. It's, it is great to me that Barry is this guy who – is arguably sociopathic because he's been in this. He's, he's like he's killed all these people. He can sort of turn off his emotions, but he keeps being horrified by what people ask him to do. He's like he can't I know escape. I'm a bad, but he's like I know I'm a bad person, but you guys are awful. Yeah, <laughs> it's so perfect. Yeah, and the, no ho Hank, no ho Hank's the best. Yeah, he is one of the best characters on television. That guy blows me away with his performance yeah. of this like this uh, Chechen. Is that what it is? Yeah. Um, uh, head head of the the mafia, <laughs> the guy going on. He's just such a nice guy. He's he's just a he's such a gentle man. Yeah, he just loves <laughs> his Barry. whole thing where he thinks he's gonna die, and he tells his whole crew what a nice guy he is, and how he doesn't want to be this badass kingpin. They all turn on him. It's amazing. It's so good. Yeah, Barry season two was was phenomenal, and I'm I'm someone who thought season one was just okay. Yeah. What else uh, we got? Next up was Fleabag season two and f- second and final season. Less. Yes. Oh. Um, yeah, I, I. It kills a part of me that there's not going to be more flea bag. Like, what are we supposed to do now? Just to go on with our lives? Like, yep. it, yeah, it's, uh, that show is phenomenal. I loved flea bag season one. We've already talked about this on the on the show in yep. another episode. Season one was one of the best things I'd ever seen. I just adored it. Season two took that up a notch and made it one of the truly one of the best things I've in television. Yeah. Um, it deepens all of the jokes and all of the quips from season one, like all of this character establishment for what could have just been a funny kind of joke and moved on just gets deeper and deeper. I mean, it opens with the shit with her sister mm-hmm. in season two. Uh, they bring in hot priest who is uh, another no name character. On Moriarty. The show. Moriarty. But he's, yeah, yeah he's Moriarty uh, from Sherlock all weekend at uh, the previously mentioned ATX television fest during interviews. If there was ever a moment where I, I was chatting off mic with celebs about, you know, well, what do you, what were you binge watching on the plane on the way here? It, Inevitably was Fleabag. Yeah. So that my, my finished my Letterkenny interview and then spent 20 more minutes talking to Nathan Dale, who plays Daryl on Letterkenny, about Fleabag. Yeah, Fleabag mm-hmm. is a master class in television. It's Phoebe Waller-Bridge, who, by the way, is also running or at least was heavily involved in Killing Eve. Mm-hmm. So she makes good TV. She is doing a pass on the uh, new James Bond. Yeah, that makes sense. Ooh, wow. Uh, also has uh, Olivia Coleman, Brett Gilman. Uh, previously mentioned Andrew Scott, who played Moriarty. It's a great little cast. It is a phenomenal show. It's 12 episodes. Well, and the, So one of the things that made him so great as Moriarty, actually, I, I didn't care for him as much as Moriarty. His craziness, his quirkiness makes him appreciably dangerous yeah. to me. Like, there was something really dangerous about Moriarty in the Sherlock. Like, he seemed actually crazy, but too smart to be safe. And that same zaniness that comes off him makes him this approachable, lovable priest. Like, it, it's somehow that same quirk makes him human and approachable to me when he's in this role, where it made him dangerous to me as Moriarty. Same actor, works in a completely different manner, and I love that half the characters on this show have no names. Fleabag is yeah. Fleabag, Hot yeah. Priest is Hot Priest. Yeah. Go ahead. This show makes the best use of the third wall break. It makes Fourth wall. The, the fourth wall break. Yeah. It makes... Uh, yeah, it makes like uh, the Deadpool, the first Deadpool movie, yeah. seem like amateur and hour. And then season two cranks that up a notch. Exactly. Yeah. And does that amazing thing <coughs> where uh, they bring the hot priest in on it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And you kind of get this thing where, at least for me watching, you realize, oh, nobody's paying attention to her. It's yep. not that, you know, oh, it's magic of TV. And no, no, no. Literally just everybody is ignoring her. Yeah, he's the only one really looking at her. Yeah. And he can, like, what are you doing? But yeah, that. That her that her checkout dissociation, this is how I'm not really part of the group, becomes part of their connection is beautiful. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I thought it was interesting when she's talking to a the therapist and she's like, oh, I do have friends and acknowledges us, the audience, as her yeah. friend. Yeah. And I'm like, 
oh, this makes this whole thing a little bit deeper. Yeah. Because, you know, you, you want to think it's that kind of that um, uh, Kevin Spacey House of Cards thing. Yeah. Of like, oh, I'm also the devious narrator. But it's like, oh, no, there's also a little bit of, uh, of a disconnect from the rest of humanity and a, a little uh, a streak of crazy there. Mm-hmm. One of my favorite uh, underspoken characters in this is the uh, the guy who gives her the loan, who comes back for the yeah, first time. Really didn't expect him season. to keep coming back. But yeah, yeah, when he watches the shop and yeah, I'll watch it and yeah. gives her a hamster and yeah, yep. yeah. That why that are you dressed like that if you don't amazing. start your job until I just like it? Yeah, <laughs> it, this is it's basically six hours of TV. It's on Prime. Everyone should watch it. Yes. Yeah. Uh, Kai, you want to talk about one of our other discuss- discoveries this year, which is True TV's I'm Sorry? Yeah, talk about uh, a network to hide a TV show on. Yeah, yeah. Because <laughs> I feel like if this had been on any other network that got more play... It'd be huge. Yeah, you'd be hearing a lot more people talk about it. But um, I'm Sorry is the Andrea Savage mm-hmm. uh, written and uh, starring in it, She's the creator and star, yep. Um, and uh, essentially, it is... I'm trying to think of other shows that, that do this. Uh, it's where, curb your enthusiasm in a lot of ways. Exactly, yeah. Where it's kind of following her career, and she works in show business, but um, where she kind of has a different angle that I haven't seen before is she's very much a family person, but not like you know sitcom family person. She's like you know what you or I would be like with our spouse or with our kid. Yeah, her, her husband played by Tom Everett Scott. The chemistry between them, one of the best marriages on television. Oh yeah. There's also um, all this um, like bonus feature stuff where they interview each other, mm-hmm. and I think those are almost just as good because now it's not husband and wife, but it's like boss and coworker. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so I feel like. Like she can like uh, step the jokes up just a pinch more, um, but it follows her her writing partner um, who in the first season was played by uh, who's the guy you guys were just talking about from Jason the league? Manzoukas. Jason Manzukis, yep. um, who is great on that. Yep. There's so many um, actors you see in everything else that just pop on the show for five minutes. Yep, um, have like a great joke and then you know back onto the story. Um, also, it's, the- uh, it's worth noting that. Uh, Allison Tolman is her like her buddy, and she's great here from Fargo. <coughs> yeah, and her parents are played by Martin Mull and Kathy Baker, and I love Martin Mull's oh, character. Oh, I forgot about that. And and Kathy Baker, her mom and her dad, like she has that same the uh, not flirty but like snarky, honest relationship with both of them. Uh huh. And just like her relationship with her with her husband is one of those great uh, husband wife thing. This parent adult child thing. I've not seen it done this well on TV in a way that's both funny and charming and real. Yeah, the one of my favorite episodes of the season, the she's fighting with her mom, and the dad's kind of taking her side yeah. until she just takes it a little too far, mm-hmm. and then the dad comes around and it's like, "That's my wife you're talking about. That's your yeah, mother. That's your Shut mother. Your yeah. mouth, yep. you know." And you're like, "Whoa!" Like you really buy that they are a family uh, and kind of invest in each other. Also, I don't want to spoil it, but there's an arc long joke that that runs in the background, and when Ooh. it pays off. At the end of season two, I was dying. Yeah, the uh, and you probably won't even see it coming. You won't see it coming. I, I don't even want to say another word because no, I mean neither. I don't yeah. want to spoil it. But no, it's all we were talking about after we finished it. Um, this is watching this with my spouse. We saw ourselves in this show. Every joke that they made was something that we had experienced personally, and it's just a uh, laugh a minute. Um, I'm trying to think what are some of the other standouts from this last season because there was one episode. Well, there was the teacher playing along with when he when she got caught in the gag in the gag. That and was the teacher a good playing one. along with it. That was pretty good. Um, yeah, I'm probably going to think of it later when you guys are talking about yours. But season one is all on Netflix. Mm-hmm. Season two will be coming to Netflix soon. Yeah, totally worth watching. Get on this. I bought a season pass. It's all right, good. I'm going to talk about another Netflix show, Sex Education, which is a British show. Uh, people probably first noticed it because Gillian Anderson is playing. An older sex therapist in it, uh, someone who's very comfortable talking about sex. In fact, too comfortable for her teenage son, played by Asa Butterfield, who becomes, despite he's being a virgin, a sex expert at his high school when he, when he becomes friends with and sort of has a crush on sort of one of the bad girls of the school, uh, played by Emma, McKe- Emmy Ma- Emma Mackey, named Maeve. He has a gay best friend. Uh, and this is sort of about being a kid, uh, discovering sex. And sort of what everyone is doing uh, about sex when they're when they're a teenager, and how clueless teenagers are about sex, and they really kind of need people to talk them through it. It's also about relationship stuff. It's also about the relationship he has with his mom. 
There's a sort of a gay bashing story that goes on there. There's it's also all, the mom's bullshit with the, the handyman. Yeah, and, yeah. And her, how she doles out advice but can't apply it to herself. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, this was a great show. I saw the first episode of Euphoria. I think it's probably about the same thing. <laughs> <laughs> really not. I've heard. Yeah. I've heard it's a sister show. It really is. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, they seem pretty similar. Who? Uh, who's that main guy? The Ender's Game kid? Uh, Ozra Butterfield. Man, he He's does great. so good at playing the like uh, the the sexually embarrassed. Yeah. Like, the, like it's. Uh, I don't. I don't know if that's a good way of describing it, but it's like that embarrassment you get when somebody's talking about sex yeah. around you. Yeah. And I'm like, to consistently do that throughout the course of the series, like, that was kind of impressive. And his and Maeve's back and forth is amazing. His He fucks up and, and lets his best friend down, and yeah. that is played out beautifully. Yep. The best friend is never just written off as a trope <laughs> or, or used for just jokes or a B-plot. Uh, the the best friend's I'm blanking on the character's name. His relationship with his dad is surprising oh, and amazing. Man, that's that's got uh, some, one of the best moments in the show. Yeah, and I yeah I really loved sex. It, uh, it also they made a decision to set the show in a fictional time and place. Yeah, so that it's nineties ish, but but present day. And it's in England ish, but they've got like letter jacket type. Yeah, stuff. It's it, the Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory. Yeah, it's. <laughs> I, I love this kind of in between. I mean, I've seen some people online that really didn't enjoy not being able to pin down where and when it is. But some people really like specificity. Yeah, yeah. That, to me, there's something that allows it to really operate in a kind of a magical space. I agree, and I, I thought I thought the first season was really really good. Um, I liked I liked all the relationship stuff with him and Maeve. I, there's a there's an abortion story that I think is handled really really well. There's a girl that changes. A, totally different level of, of subject than the abortion story that's handled really well, but the girl that changes clicks. Yeah. Uh, there's there's some tiny, powerful stuff and then huge plots, and they handle it all uh, with aplomb. It's, it's pretty impressive. Yeah. Uh, do you have something, Kyle? No, 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 not about sex education. Okay. It also gives uh, – is it Scully – that's the mom. Yeah, it's Scully. Yeah, uh, her doing her best, Emma Thompson. It's yes, <laughs> yes, for sure. Jillian Anderson. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I want to jump over to another show. Kyle, Ooh. did you have a thought? Yeah. No, I was just going to say. I told you I'd think of that yep, later. You did. Back to I'm sorry, real quick. The episode where they go to the cooking class. Her and the best friend. Oh, that was great. Yeah. So there is an episode in the season. I think it's probably one of the standouts. But her best friend divorced and is kind of going through that. She has just like one of the most like stand your ground, like badass, you know. uh, She goes off on a cheating husband in the middle of the class. Yeah. And (laughs) uh, we're not giving anything away by saying that. But you have to see this episode. That was my standout for the series. So I want to mention Shrill, which was on Hulu. Okay. Which is uh, A.D. Bryant um, from Saturday Night Live. Playing uh, Annie Easton, who is based on a real life, uh, I guess, uh, plus size reporter, and this is her, like Lindy she, West. Lindy West, thank you. Who is right? Who writes a lot of the show and developed it? Um, she is a she is she's working for this small Portland uh, news weekly or a alternate alternate newspaper. Her boss is this guy who is clearly like a gay icon, but has become sort of the, literally Dan Savage. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and he's become this sort of asshole. Who fat shames her all the time and in the guise of helping her is kind of mean to her a lot of the time. There's a lot of push pull there. She's got some stuff from her sort of well meaning parents who love her but also are also kind of fat shaming her. And it has her sort of discovering her own sexual identity, what it's like to sort of own being larger in this in this world. It had a lot to say. It was a point of view I've not seen before. It was really, really funny. It was really, really well done. The only disappointment I had is they only showed like six episodes. And I think the half season, it was like a half season. The rest of it's coming. Um, but this, it's, was, this was a show that people I know who don't binge watch television binged. Yeah. Like I, I where, where it was like, no, no, we're watching the next show right now. Like, But it's 1030. Are you sure you're going to watch another TV show? Yes, we're watching another TV show right now. Yeah, they. I don't care. I love this. This is great. Let's do this. <laughs> they did a they did a really good job of, of again. It's a it's a point of view you don't don't see on TV. It's something you have not seen before, even though it's done. I mean, they've got the doofus boyfriend. They've got her love life. They've got her work stuff. Like it's it's her relationship with her parents. Like in structure, it's all similar to things you've seen before, but it's a different uh, when, approach. When that first episode opens with her just putting on clothes, yeah, yeah, and and. It, it is handled so honestly and and casually and beautifully. Uh, the pool party episode. The pool party is episode is stunning. Is I 
as a guy still wear actual pants and jeans to pool parties. <laughs> like I, yeah, it, yeah, I feel like the show should speak to everybody. And by the way, another nod to uh, the great casting of parents here. Julia Sweeney as her mom oh is God. fantastic. You know, one of the things I loved about the show was that in the first couple episodes, they really uh, hammer home how sleazy and despicable the uh, the boyfriend is. Yeah. And he kind of gets a redemption. He kind of does. The, yeah. the By the end of the second episode, yeah. I didn't want him to come back on the show. And yeah, and yeah he gets when he trips with her fucking talk. You're yeah. like, oh, I see what your deal is. Yeah. Okay, yeah. I know you. I got you, buddy. It's the devil you know. <laughs> yeah. Uh, all right, let's close up talking about Umbrella Academy. Umbrella Academy? Yeah. I was excited for this one in particular because big fan of the comic book series. Mm-hmm. And uh, it's it's written by Gabriel Way, illustrated by um, uh, Ba, something Ba. Uh, Gabriel Ba. Is it Gabriel Ba? Gabriel Gerard Way. Gerard Way. Oh, yeah. I, 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 I he was in a band, mixed them right? together. Yeah, he was, he was in uh, My Chemical Romance. sincerely romance. asking. Like, My I don't Chemical know Romance. Oh, yeah. I've listened. And the go if you're interested in that, go back and check out one of their first music videos for uh, I'm Not Okay. This thing is like a directed like hour of well, I mean it's three minutes but it's like a TV show like especially for the time that it came out their production value for their music video was like at, up there with artists that were making way more money than that. Hmm. It was a it was just a very impressive comic when it came out. It kind of caught yeah. me off guard with just how surreal it was, but um, how familiar a lot of the beats felt of of these young kids that are all super powered and they're recruited or adopted into this family to be a, a, a family of superheroes it but was how a, damaging that can be when you jump ahead it was a very Grant Morrison approach yeah yeah like like it was it was it was something we'd seen before but done really expertly by somebody who was new to comics yeah yeah if if, if somebody new to comics had like sat down and read X-Men and went but in real in reality professor X is kind of a monster, kind of a monster for grabbing these kids like this uh, Doom Patrol this year mind similar territory yeah. in, in a weirder context, but yeah. Umbrella I binged straight through. Yeah, uh, me too. And I was just kind of taken by the um, how it could have gone two ways. It, it could really have. could have gone bad. I was nervous, and the fact that the for the most part relatively like unknown or lesser parts uh, cast mm-hmm. were able to um, carry this. In a way, like how is Ellen Page one of the Honestly, least Ellen notable Page was, ones? Yeah, she's the least grabbing, like at least a uh, captivating character to me. Yeah, I I loved the siblings so much more than I thought I would. I loved Five so much. Yeah, the, Five was great mm, casting. Klaus was great casting. Yes, I mean Klaus getting the dude from Misfits is just that brilliant. Insane. Oh my and god! By the way, Mary J. Blige and Cameron Britton. As, oh, they are uh, great as Hazel and Cha Cha. Yeah, they were. That was an expansion of characters from the comics, like. One of the things I really liked about Umbrella Academy is that it's true to the spirit of the comics, but it's not a lot like the comics. Like the, the plot isn't very it's it's got structural elements, but There's it's a lot missing, of similarities. It's but missing it's, a lot of the weirder stuff. They toned it down. They found what worked in TV, and this is like this is how you would do the show if you were doing it for TV yeah. instead of comics. Because like Hazel really and Cha Cha are characters that I don't really like. Like I yeah. sh- and 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 I didn't expect to work for me on the TV show. I was yeah. kind of they started to speak to the. To like, if you th- you mentioned I'm like thinking that Neil Gaiman gets a little yeah. too twee in yeah. his writing sometimes. This is where it leaned a little too heavy on like, oh, you were in a very black clad teen band, yeah, uh, yeah, <laughs> and you wrote this comic where because you read some X Men once. Mm-hmm. Cool. I grew up on X Men, and that's okay. Like that's how I felt about Hazel and Cha Cha until they cast Mary J Blige and the guy that was Ed from yeah, uh, Mind Hunter. Oh. And he and his romance, like his May December romance with uh, mm-hmm. the uh, flower, the waitress, yep, absolutely steals the show. It does. Uh, and and I and I I expected to not like them. Right, right. Yeah, it it all like it's all so well composed with the uh, the the soundtrack that they mm-hmm. they infuse yeah. with it mm-hmm. that it makes all of the scenes so much more memorable too, and. It was just fun. It was a and fun they, binge show. They did get a season two. Yeah, yeah. they did. They got a season two. Thank Yeah, I wouldn't really matter. Because the way that happened. shit ends. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It was quite a gamble if they did not but, do a second season with that. <laughs> I want to specifically call out uh, one thing, though, is this, the ending on 
Think We're Alone Now with the big dance party scene. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That is what hooked me. Like, I was already into the show, but that was like, that's what hooked me to binge the rest of it. And then when they. About, they do that dollhouse view of yeah. all of them dancing in the house. Yeah, yeah. It's so good. And then halfway through, they do another big dance scene that is dan- to Dancing in the Moonlight. Mm-hmm. And that's put that on my playlist for the rest of the year. Yeah. It's such a memorable scene. It's such oh, a great moment. Oh, gosh. I remember that. Yeah. This is, and, and it's easily, like, if people have not watched this, it is easily shorthanded as Wes Anderson's X Men. Yeah, that's ah. a good way to put it. I think that they brought, like I said, I think they brought this to to the screen in a way that it's true to the source material. The Royal X Men, but they make it work uh, on TV in a way that I was a little afraid it was going to be. You know, Marvel stuff on TV sometimes a little too afraid of the costumes, a little too afraid of the weirdness, right? And they're not afraid of that here, but at the same time, they recognize that. You can't really do a sentient Eiffel Tower as easily in TV as you can in comics, so maybe leave that part out and let the comic reader. Doom Patrol had a gender queer street. Yeah, <laughs> so maybe you can at this point. But anyway, yeah, what what a what a uh, uh, great surprise this year. Real quick, uh, Wes Anderson's X Men is a thing. You should go check it's, it out on YouTube. Saturday, <laughs> really it's Saturday Night Live. Uh, oh, right. oh, no, it's uh, right. Patrick uh, Williams. He's just a YouTube oh. filmmaker. Oh, okay. Yeah, um, yeah. We're gonna real quick run down the list of other shows we that were on our our short list. We did have some other notables that yeah. we we're not gonna you know dissect, but so and I won't say some of these one person put in, some of them like three or four of us put in. But on the list of things that are, people should check out, uh, Game of Thrones if you haven't heard of it. Yeah, I'll, uh, yeah, you check um, that one out. <laughs> uh, Russian Doll on Netflix, mm-hmm. Veep's final mm-hmm. season and Crashing's final season on HBO. Brooklyn Nine Nine over at NBC has done a great transition. Final season and really all the seasons of You're the Worst, all three seasons of Easy, which wrapped up this year on Netflix, Doom Patrol on the DC app, Good Omens, which is on Prime, which we'll be talking about coming up, What We Do in the Shadows on FX, which I think Kyle and I in particular have been super impressed oh, with. Oh yeah, uh, The Good Place season three. Uh, oh, is that ain't good? I've heard it's good. <laughs> okay, uh, check it out. Discovery in the Orville, which Kyle describes as two slides of the same coin, which <laughs> Orville season two is, a, is, is great. really great. Yeah. Uh, Afterlife, which I've blanked on. I've, I've forgotten what Afterlife Ricky is. Ricky That was that Ricky Gervais. Right. Yeah, and if you haven't watched this, like, it'll get some real tears good. out of you. Yeah, it's and surprising. That's Netflix? Yep. Mm-hmm. Hard and then, pass. And then Weird City, <laughs> over on, Weird City over on YouTube. Fuck, I forgot about Weird City. Which yeah. was surprisingly good and was everything we kind of yep. wanted Twilight Zone And you can be. go back and listen to our uh, Jose Molina interview if you want to listen to the showrunner from that. <laughs> uh, I just keep thinking about that uh, Michael Sarah episode. That's like the most <laughs> memorable one. And it's so fucking weird. It's weird. By the way, uh, speaking of, and I, and I don't want to uh, t- down talk too much stuff, but is Twilight Zone the biggest disappointment of this year? Uh it's got to be up there. There was a lot of hype for it, and pff, it's not delivered. Such hype. It, it kind of just came and, and went. Like, I, I tried. It wasn't I watched, offensively bad. I watched just, eight no, episodes, I, I, and I kept I waiting want, for it to get better. <laughs> yeah. It just, I, I'm not thrilled to watch it each week. Yeah. I, I just, every you time was like eight? a... I, I can't believe it, it almost all the entire season. I, wa- I kept watching because I wanted to like it so much, and I kept. I wanted it to be a half hour show. It should have been a half hour show. You know what always fascinates me is the TV that uh, kind of like captures the zeitgeist. I think we mentioned that earlier. Yeah, yeah. And even if like I imagine most of the stuff we talked about tonight, you haven't seen all of it. I mean, maybe you have if you, if you're a huge fan. But I imagine everybody this year in 2019. Watch that fucking Maria Kondo tidying up show. <laughs> like, I have not... Right. The, I have heard so many people talking about that show, and it's like, you know there's other TV out No, but there, that right? corresponded beautifully. Like, it, I mean, it was the start of the year. I had a room in my house that had kind of been slowly acquiring crap that shouldn't go yeah. in other rooms yeah. and, and had decided, like, start of the year, I'm, that's going to be my New Year's resolution thing is we're gonna, I'm going to clean out oh. that room. And so, like, I went to do that, and I, I literally I turned on Netflix just to find, like, you know, a bunch of old Supernatural episodes or something that I could just leave on while yeah. fucking around and sure. was like, oh, well, this looks <laughs> absolutely <laughs> apropos. So we threw on Tidying Up and it ended up being... And he sat on the couch and watched it instead of cleaning. <laughs> no, it, it, it ended up being the weird, like, you'd zone out for a second, but it wasn't a show you'd... Like, you'd sit down on the couch and take a break and start watching the show, and the show would be constantly reminding you, like, oh, man, I want to keep going again, though. <laughs> and And we really, did, like... I felt like it kind of gave us the the little additional push uh, that and a bunch of queer eye episodes <laughs> 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 to keep to keep tidying up our shit. 
All right. Well, that's the first half of the year, which is pretty solid, I got to say. It's been a good TV year. Does I'm, it depress you guys to think that we're going to forget about all these shows by December when we only, make our best of the year list? It doesn't, but only because uh, we're going to forget about them when the back half of the year just like shoves them out of our brain with like amazing <sighs> I peaked at that TV list. Show-ness. Ooh, it's it's coming. Guys. I don't even there's, know what's coming for the rest of the year. There's stuff coming up. I I did a little bit of prep for the what we're excited about, what's coming up. There's some good stuff on that list. Oh, we have an episode where we're going to talk about what's coming up again? I think it's a possibility. Oh, good. I, I'm, I'm looking forward to that. Your real Rob reboot. No. <laughs> no. Real Rob. Don't mention really, that Really, really Rob. Oh, new listeners don't know if I'm if, kidding or not. If you guys say it another time, he's going to show up. <laughs> oh, oh, God. So everyone be quiet. We're going to turn off the lights. <laughs> and... TV dudes, make it podcast. <laughs> TV dudes out. The TV Dudes is an independently run podcast and a member of the Electric Sweater Podcast Network. We are exclusively listener supported. If you'd like to help us out, go to patreon.com slash TV Dudes. You can like us on Facebook and Twitter at TV Dudes. All the music for our show is by our friend and original TV dude, Gregory J. Amani Smith. To find out more about us, go to the TV Dudes.com and electric sweater.com. I'm Grant Davis. Thanks for listening. <laughs>